you're on. Um, but a little background in case this is your first event with Shine Registry. We are a platform for women who are starting businesses uh, to ask for the things that they need in the style of a wedding registry. And so we believe if you can ask for a gravy boat when you're getting married, there's all this stuff that you need when you're starting a company, you should be able to ask for that too. Uh, and so we are hosting a series of these learning hour business showers where we're bringing in experts to talk about different subjects. And on a related note, we are throwing virtual business showers for folks who are using Shine Registry. And so today, uh, related to STEM education, our business shower recipient is Nina Barbudo, uh, based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I see a few people in the chat who are from Pittsburgh. So if you're not familiar with Nina and the work that uh, she's doing in Assemble yet, um, today's a great day to start, start finding out about her. Uh, when you go to her, her Shine Registry profile, you'll see that she is asking for support in a few different ways. I am just gonna seal the share screen for a quick second to um, show everyone Nina's Shine Registry profile. Um, on here, you'll get a little bit more information about Assemble and the work that they're doing. Um, and you'll also see the registry of things that she's asking for. One of the things that really sets Shine Registry apart from other sites uh, is that we include non-monetary asks. Uh, we're in the process of relaunching our site in a few months where we'll have more robust crowdfunding tools. But in the meantime, I've selected a few quick, free things that I can do or commit to uh, along with that, you know, I, I, that I just know is gonna support her um, and the work that she's doing. And so I am hitting fulfill. Do, do, do. I'm already signed in. Uh, and you all can feel free to call me after this because I am putting in my phone number. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's super quick. It's super easy. Uh, we really want to encourage everyone who is a part of today's event. Uh, these are free events, but it makes a big difference to our community uh, when you are able to contribute to the folks who are on our site. Um, and we hope you continue following the work that we're doing to help promote small business owners, particularly uh, during the pandemic. Um, but that's all I have to say about China Industry for now. I'm going to drop the link to Nina's profile in the chat again, um, and I'll, I'll remind folks at the end of this as well. But without further ado, I want to introduce Chloe Taylor, who uh, is a lot more exciting to listen to than I am. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll let you take it away, Chloe. Thanks for, thanks for being our facilitator today. Thanks so, so much. And yes, thanks for having me shine registry. Please support Assemble. I love the idea of being able to support in more ways than just donating, but also just to show support online and to follow her work. So I'm really happy to be doing this. Hello, everyone. I am really excited to talk to you. I know that there has been so much confusion and fear and indecisiveness around what we're doing with kids in the fall. Um, on the teacher end, on the parent end. And in thinking about putting this workshop together, I really wanted to focus on what we know and what we can control and start from that place and build out to learning with creative technology um, because it's so crucial. Um, I think something that we can all agree on is that we do want our kids to be in school, whether that would be traditional homeschooling with abilities to take field trips and to collaborate and to have visitors or to be in a traditional school building where they're happily seeing their friends and working with teachers. Like we all want that. <laughs> it's just not very possible right now. So I've really come from the place of what can we, how can we utilize technology and how can we use what we know about kids to give them um, a meaningful experience using what we have. Um, before I get started, I would like to know, I'm, I'm making this pretty flexible. So sometimes I'm in a Zoom call and I'm mute, no camera, I'm just listening passively, and sometimes I'm actively engaged. It's your choice. I will ask either that you type in the chat or unmute, or unmute and say um, whether you're a parent, a teacher, both, and what are you... Um, What's your plan for the fall if you have one? So I would like to get just a little bit of information if you feel comfortable. Um, type in the chat, parent, teacher, um, you know, 
how old your children are, if you have them. Um, yeah, just trying to learn more about creative technology. Great. Hi, Annie. Hi. Great. Parent. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Okay. So, Rob, you're in a really particular situation, right? Because um, as a parent, I'm sure you have a lot of ideas, but like teaching and parenting and being the teacher for your children at home. <laughs> like, that's a lot. Yes, Whitney. Hi. Yes, yes, yes. Amazing mama. And we're going to talk about how to get you know, you're, some, some different things if you've got multiple children as well. Homeschooling parent, great. Okay. So can everyone hear me okay and see the screen? All right, so I'm going to try to, okay. Great, oh, okay, so you're, you're hiring a certified teacher to come homeschool and then you're gonna work outside of the home if I have that from Tasha, if that's correct. Okay, all right. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I have two dogs and I feel like, you know, <laughs> even getting the dogs together to do Zoom calls and work from home is kind of a challenge, right? So I can't imagine, I'm not a parent, but I am a teacher and I am an educational consultant and I understand how difficult it is to just do one job. So now we're stacking in a way that isn't really possible. Um, and I think it's important to name that we're not homeschooling. Like I said, homeschool is really rich and you know there are field trips, museum work, the students are free to go outside and meet with friends. We're not in that place right now. Um, I think what I've seen on social media and from some articles is that we're really in a crisis model of education. Um, from the plans that I've reviewed, um, I've, I've asked people to explain to me two and three different times what the plan is for the fall in different school settings because I still can't make out in my mind how we're going to have students go two to three days a week, what's the childcare situation at home. It doesn't really make sense to me at least. And I also want to be prepared in case those plans falter. What are we going to do at home if the plans are not sustainable? So I've put together a presentation and a Q&A. Um, I'll, I'll go to the next page as well. I put together a presentation that I hope is going to give you at least a little bit of inspiration or a little bit, a tip here or there that's going to make what is so important and crucial to child development, which is a structured, safe learning environment, happen in your home. At school, we can't really rely on that, but if you can get things together a little bit more for home, I'm happy to offer a few best practices or things that I've seen work well. Um, so here's the agenda. What we know and can control, that's the place I'm coming from. Um, creating a re realistic schedule, even before we get into the technological piece, I think thinking about the social emotional learning of your own child or children that you're working with is really foundational and crucial. So thinking through creating a realistic schedule. I want to highlight the difference between using digital tools and STEAM education. It's, there's a, it's getting a little conflated and I think it's important to piece out where we are using a digital tool or teaching how to use digital tools and where this is true innovation STEAM education. Um, and talk about how harnessing your child's interest and motivation, again, in my opinion, is foundational, and then we build on top of that. We're not just giving them toys or giving them materials. We're really thinking deeply about the child's interests and needs and building on top of that. Um, I have some recommended materials that I love to use in school um, that I think are great for home use as well. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about my new book that's coming out very shortly at the end of the month and share a little bit about the activities that I've written there. And if we have time, um, I hope that I'm 
good on time today. Um, but if there's time and afterwards, I'm happy to just answer questions. I know that this is a broad stroke because children differ the region, your school plan, um, you know, your age, your experience is all variable right now, but I'm hoping to hit on some common themes. All right, sound good? Are we ready to go? Okay. So let me flip to what we know and what we can control. I'm getting a little bit philosophical here, um, but I think it's important to share some norms. And again, I'm checking the chat. So if you'd like to add something or ask a question, please feel free to do that. So what we know, we, and in watching the news every night, I hear this over and over, kids should be in school. Kids need structure. Kids need to know what to expect. They want to go to school. They want to be back. I know that. I think we all know that and can agree to that. And that's not the issue. I think, um, say, personally, I would love to see a lot of the children that I've worked with in the past and a lot of the teachers that I have worked with go back into a safe school environment. But what we know right now is that we don't know much about how it will, the virus will spread and how it will affect a school population. Can I control that? No. What we can control is starting to build a really safe learning environment at home um, to continue as educators to give information and to support parents at home and to make resources available um, and try to leverage technology in a way that brings us together as opposed to um, putting children in their own silos. And that's where the creative part comes into place. Uh, let me flip here. So let's start with creating a schedule, just out of curiosity and no judgment. Again, I'm not even a parent, I'm coming from an educator perspective. If you feel comfortable in the chat, um, please let me know if you already have a schedule, if you had one at home during the school year and now summertime is free, um, or if you don't at all. And when I say schedule, I mean like during the school year, maybe your school says, okay, your child's on Zoom at eight o'clock and then nine o'clock and then 10 o'clock, or maybe you have your own. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've heard from a few parents that they were just getting by with the school year and having some structured activities and structured classes. And now that it's summertime, they are really reaching. So, okay. So we have a mixed bag here. I think my background is in early childhood education. I work in creative technology and I consult around STEM education. Um, but really my background and when I started working, I started um, in early childhood. And one of the most important parts of a day in an early childhood classroom is creating a schedule and having a visual tool for children to track what part of the day they are in. So if you think back to you know kindergarten and there are the schedule cards that say the morning meeting and then reading, gym, lunch, it's so crucial for children to know what they've already done, what to expect and how they're going to get through the day. So if you don't have one at home, I would really recommend making just nothing elaborate, but some small schedule cards to hang up either on your refrigerator or on a wall in their room. Um, I've seen parents, some parents just have like a post-it that they move as the activity is completed. But for, it makes a world of difference when a child wakes up in the morning and saying like, oh, today is our, today is our computer day or today I have our, my, my virtual science class as opposed to what am I doing today? or having to remember on their own. So definitely a visual schedule for early childhood, even elementary students, and certainly for middle school or older students, just having everything on a Google calendar so that they can anticipate what each day is and that we're creating a schedule that they can stick to even in 
I can't stand this phrase, but I'm going to use it these unprecedented times. <laughs> so having something, even for myself, knowing, okay, I'm spacing out my calls. This is when I'll have lunch. This is when I'll go for a run. It does give me a little bit of control back that I've lost completely this year. <laughs> Chill, think about how badly children need that, right? So even if they have their school schedule that you know, school's ended, now it's summertime, coming up with something that works for their schedule, meaning also their energy level, um, when they want to eat, when they want to go to sleep, I think is important. Um, what I saw a lot of in the past couple of months was the hustle culture even being pushed down onto kids. So, you know, my daughter's day starts at 7.30, starts at 8. In my opinion, I think that it, again, from an educator's perspective and not from a parent perspective, from my opinion, in the summertime, if there isn't a need to have um, an anchored schedule to Zoom classes or whatever it may be, really try to work with what your child naturally wants to do. If your child naturally gets up at 8.30 in the morning, then it makes sense to start the day at 8.30. But I was a child and I am an adult that loves to sleep in, so I'm not going to demand that I get up at seven o'clock every day. It's really a nice time to tailor what works for your child to the schedule um, and to be flexible. Also keep in mind, we're at home because we're fighting a pandemic we're not just leisurely at home. So it needs to be flexible because month to month, our lives are changing. Um, and also it doesn't necess necessarily translate to have a school day schedule at home. And I saw a lot of this in New York, New York City schools this spring. A lot of principals said, well, we're just going to drop the school schedule that we have onto Zoom, and so if your class was an hour in real life, it's an hour on Zoom. In my opinion, it doesn't really translate. It doesn't, especially for young children, that's a lot of attending to something that's far, it, it's virtual, right? And then it becomes screen time in a sense. It's not the same as having, um, you know, breakout sessions or time to tinker, or independent work. You're really just watching the screen. So think about that really mindfully. Um, as a work from home person, as opposed to teaching in a school, my school day was what, eight or nine hours. And as a work from home person, three to four hours really does work for me. And it's the most I can do. After three to four hours, I'm a little burnt out from the day and I know that about myself. I have friends that work as graphic designers and other professions that feel fine working that eight to nine. But for me, my schedule is three to four hours in the afternoon and that's what I can manage. Okay, so let me just look in the chat. So replicated the schedule. Yeah, I think because it was a crisis and we were in school one day and at home the next, it made sense to keep the consistency of the school schedule. But now as we see that we're in this for the long haul, we have to be flexible. So I would just encourage, even in the conversations that you're having with teachers and administrators and kids, like the only constant is change and we're going to make a schedule based on works best for us right now. So we, we're talking about going back, uh, someone said in the chat, August 1st, I think. So we're really bumping up against back to school, but who knows where we'll be even in four to six weeks as a nation. So let's stay flexible. Um, any questions regarding creating a schedule? You can either type them or unmute, and then I'll move on to the next point. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that I see a real differentiation between using digital tools and STEM or STEAM education. I also see a differentiation between STEM and STEAM, but let's talk about using digital tools. So when I, when I say digital tools, what I consider using technology to be defined as is using a computer using Zoom, Google Classroom, being able to work a tablet independently, maybe 
shooting a video or recording music. You're making a Word document, writing a Word document, whatever it may be. You're using technology and, and the tools provided to us by technology to facilitate the learning. So that became crucial and you'd be surprised at how many Google Classroom uh, workshops I ran for teachers who just never felt they needed to do it beforehand and now were forced online. So the question became, how can you still continue your course when you don't have the in-person community available? What will you use? And a lot of the answer to that is our technology tools, computers, tablets, Google Classroom, all of that. That's very different than thinking, than teaching and engaging in STEM education. Although many times when I talk to schools about their technology program, there's a blend. So maybe students are doing typing. They, a lot of schools love to teach typing and think it's still important. Um, maybe they are um, learning how to make presentations online. It's all important, but for me, there's a real distinction between using the tools and STEM education. For my business and my consulting, I've mostly done STEM education, but it's now going into digital tools because that's what is needed at the moment. So there is an opportunity. I, previously, STEM education has my heart and that's what I focused on, that really specialized um, area of innovating and making and tinkering and getting down to foundational concepts of technology. Now, because of the pandemic, things are kind of neck and neck for me because a lot of kids, a lot of parents, and a lot of teachers never had to rely on using digital tools. It's now become almost the number one skill that needs to be shared. If you have young children, it's really important that they can get on Zoom at this point. <laughs> I'm teaching a baby science um, class, which I really love. And it's a mix of science and art, and it's a parallel class. So I have written out projects, which I give on a Google Doc to parents ahead of time. Children are between two and five years old. And they gather the materials, very simple materials, I show a slideshow, we do the routines just how we would in a classroom, and then I demo a project as the parents facilitate the project with their child at home. I love it. Would I have done that last year? Probably not. But now because we have to, we are, and I do see value in it. I'm very passionate about the hands-on aspect of working with technology, um, working with young children. I think that we can't take away um, that hands-on element. Not everything can be clicking on the screen, but this has been a nice workaround to allow children still to have that creativity, still to answer really deep questions, and for me to give prompts to the parents, to have a conversation with the parents, and I love it. I think it's great. Um, it does require that kids know how to use digital tools well right? Like they have to sit up in the Zoom meeting and we cover to, to show that they're raising their hands uh, to mute and unmute. They're learning those skills. They've become really, really important. Um, is any, so this is the first baby science, like baby science class, ages two to five that I'm teaching. Is anybody here in the workshop today enrolled in a virtual class for their children? or are you relying on the school? So if you wanna type in the chat, um, let me know if you're relying on what your school is doing or if you've signed up for independent classes or, or neither. Okay. And has the school given any summer activity, I wonder, as well? Okay, so following along with the school, independent classes. Okay, so no summer activities. I think the teachers barely, barely made it anyway, so I understand that. Okay. Okay, no summer, no summer. So we've got to get some summer stuff. The program that I'm teaching with is really sweet. It's an art program, but they've offered up 
virtual um, classes for young children and their parents. Mm, okay. Yeah, and to be fair, schools, some schools were super prepared to, to pivot to virtual and some were not. Um, it, we're really exposing a lot of the equity issues in education. Math work, okay. Yeah, it's a mixed bag. I think it's more important what we're learning now and what I'm classifying it as is radical self-reliance at this point. Like we're, you, we need to now use technology in a way to bring and fill, know the gaps that need to be filled, bring it in and to create something on our own because relying on schools, they're scrambling as well. Okay, so let me flip now to STEAM education. So let me just do a show, a virtual show of hands. Do you feel like you're a beginner in learning about STEM or STEAM? Intermediate, advanced? I'd like to speak to all of it, but um, Let's see what people say. Advanced, all right. So I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> Beginner, intermediate. Oh, good. Hey, okay. So Emily, I like that you mentioned the A and STEAM. Um, okay, so STEM is the abbre abbreviation for science, technology, engineering, and math, and the interaction between all of those subjects. Um, the A, I don't really usually include because I'm not, I'm, I am teaching an art class virtually, like I said, the science and art class, but I do consider art to be special, to be, um, it's not just, you know, finger painting and putting together macaroni necklaces. I usually consider myself to be a STEM education consultant because I don't come from an art background and I want to do the art component justice. I think there are people who beautifully bring art into those subject areas. I don't take it lightly. I'm saying STEAM today because I think as many aspects of this subject matter that we can capture for kids at home and we want them to be artistic and reflective, um, I think it helps. When, I'm, when I refer to STEM or STEAM education, I'm not thinking about Google Classroom. I'm not thinking about Microsoft Word. I'm not thinking about Zoom. I'm thinking more about computer science, using that creatively, studying robotics, and thinking about how we can innovate for our world, 3D printing, electronics, any other emerging technology that isn't necessarily um, using digital tools, but something that is constantly evolving that kids need to know the foundations of. And I find that it's really, really lacking in some schools, and it's not the schools you would sometimes anticipate. Um, a common issue that I run into is people say to me like, oh, well, that's not really a great school. It's underfunded, and so they must not have a great STEAM program. I've actually worked in really well-funded or private schools that don't have great STEAM programs, and it comes down to the experience that the faculty has, the attitude or um, the willingness to learn about something new, and also a lot of parents feel that, in my experience, feel that technology is something to, not to be utilized or not to, that screen time is something to push against. And I agree with that. I don't think that technology needs being online all the time or learning about technology doesn't require playing video games or watching TV or staying for hours online. Um, so it does, from my experience and in working in different schools, the best STEM, STEAM programs have a really informed faculty that collaborate well, not only just within their schools, but with the resources that are available online and they're hungry to learn. They have a willing faculty that wants to learn more. Uh, the worst programs and the worst um, parent components are the ones who don't 
educate themselves on what STEM or STEAM actually is and think, oh, no, 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 computers, my child's on a computer all day anyway, they're on Zoom, and I don't want them doing any more. But there, in my mind, I've always pushed for STEM because I feel like there's a world of opportunity that lies in what children can create on their own. It's vitally important. And in the pandemic, I see a lot of conflation between kids being on Zoom and not getting the actual education and STEM that we want them to have. So I'm really harping on this because it's important. So if you have a child that is, let's say elementary or middle school age, do you know if they have a STEM education program and what has happened to it since the pandemic? You can also unmute if you feel so inclined. And Rob, I might ask you as well, as a teacher, because so much of this is hands-on work and physical work, what is happening since we're virtual? Yeah, um, so I, you can, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, no, this is exactly the uh, great question that I've been, um, I and a lot of other people have been engaging with, which is how do you do this um, STEAM, which is often there's a very hands-on component that is, that's an important component. How do you do that remotely, you know? So, um, uh, you know, that's, that's been our challenge is to try to adapt some of our practices um, to be able to be done at home. But then also you want to be concerned about issues of equity and access to materials if you're um, if it's a physical project or to technology if it's a digital project so um, I'll, I'll share a couple links I made a, a couple resources that are um, have project ideas that can be done at home and then some digital uh, 3d design projects that are kind of across the curriculum that people might might be interested in too. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I thank you for doing that. Please drop that in. I have a few few resources that I'm going to share later on, but I think as much as we can get together, it um it helps. So thank you for sharing that. So on top of all of the we've talked little a little bit about the equity issues in STEM education. Again, I don't think that the school necessarily determines how strong I deem the STEM program to be. It's more of the attitude and the um, willingness of the faculty. But the pandemic has blown equity issues wide open. So you have to think a lot of students, especially black and brown students, did not have access already to consistent internet, to computers and tablets at home, um, and that teachers are having trouble reaching students. Um, they're not able to complete their work on time. So even from a digital tools perspective, we're behind. Prior to the pandemic, a lot of my focus was on ending the race and gender gap in technology. Um, and that was about industry. That was past just having a computer and access to internet. That was about even getting into the pipeline where you would know you wanted to study computer science or you would know you wanted to be um, a visual designer. How will you even get to that place? So this has put us many steps back at this point because if we can't even get a consistent internet connection, the students that were using a computer regularly at school or a 3D printer or whatever it may be, they are now several steps behind. So it's becoming even more of an emergency equity issue. And my hope is that we can get more resources available so that parents know what to do. Okay, so I've talked about STEM. So let's talk a little bit about I'm going to hop over to interest and then back into resources, if that makes sense. I hope it does because that's, <laughs> that's how I think of it. So let's say that you are at home, you have students at home, they use digital tools, but you're also interested in getting them um, exposed and into creative technology. 
first, and this is why I'm stepping off into motivation and interest and then back into tech, you really have to closely examine and listen to your child talk about their interests. Um, if you can remember being a kid and someone said, okay, you're going to study this now, like for me, it was piano. I had no motivation to learn piano. I wasn't interested in piano. I think it's a great, you know, exposure to learn an instrument and I'm glad I did. But I have not played the piano since like third or fourth grade. Why? Because I just, I don't, I don't care. Do I care about music? Sure. Do I care about singing? Yeah, I enjoy listening to music. And there's probably a way to harness that interest into an interest in the piano. But just saying, let's study the piano. No, not interested. <laughs> um, we also need to think about where kids are socially and emotionally. Like, I know for myself as an adult, I'm, my motivation and my interest has changed since the pandemic has started. I have way less motivation because I don't feel like I'm getting to go anywhere or, you know, experience new things like I used to. So I need to be flexible with my interests and motivation. I never wanted to cook before. Now I have a motivation to cook because I can't go to restaurants. It changes. Six months ago, if someone said, hey, do you want to learn how to make banana bread? I would have said, no, I don't care. Like, I'll just grab one with my coffee. That wasn't a motivation or interest. Um, it's really vitally important that, at least in my opinion, that we harness the motivation and interests of kids and then introduce tools and concepts and, and books and all kinds of resources that align because it's so hard to just give them that um, without their investment. And I feel the same about technology. Um, just, especially for our girls, I've been a Girl to Code facilitator for almost five years, and we always start from a social impact perspective. We always start with, where does your heart lie? What do you love about your community? What would you want to change? how has your life been affected by X, Y, or Z? Like we start with their passion. And to give an example, we had a student who was so, if you could even consider this passionate about junk food, like she loved, loved candy, junk food. I mean, all middle schoolers do, I guess you could say. But she was very almost fixated on it. And so we asked, what do you love about the foods that you bring every day? Why are they important to you? And what, what we were able to tease out is that her dad was a health nut. I guess he'd been sick and um, he only allowed certain foods in the house. And so she ended up building in scratch, but almost like an app that made kids think through their food choices and informed why they were reaching for, you know, a bag of Twizzlers versus pretzels or an apple like what goes through your mind when you make a food choice um, we also have students we also have middle school students who are starting to be really um, concerned about boundaries in their friendships like for instance friends using their phone when they don't want them to or trying to act like things aren't a big deal even if they do feel um, very sensitive about them. So they're starting to explore that relationship and they're really interested in it. It's something they need support in. So they started making um, almost like magazine style quiz games on Scratch. And it talks about what would you do in this scenario to help kids understand how to set boundaries in their friendships. So we always start like saying to those girls, hey, why don't you make a magazine quiz online? Maybe, I mean, they're not as invested as if we start with their own motivations and interests. Um, and if we're also validating their motivations and interests, we could have easily very, we could have very easily said, junk food, put it away, you don't need it, it's not healthy. But instead of taking that approach, we asked, why are you so interested in it? Why is this your favorite? Um, and coming, we came from an inquisitive place, which really was more validating than being the adult that knew, that knew everything and was making choices for them. So we found some unique ways to harness their motivation and interests. 
Um, when I taught kindergarten, my class was so interested in telling jokes and they were trying so hard, but none of their jokes were sensical at all and kind of also weren't funny because they didn't understand the mechanics of jokes. So we ended up putting together a really short unit on um, comedy, puns, physical comedy, improv, all different aspects so they could understand how it worked. And then they would film, they filmed like a funny lip sync video and in incorporated a lot of what they learned. So they use technology in that way. I think it's so much more powerful. And that's when you get kids that go home at night and they're like scribbling down ideas. They come to you the next day, look at this, look at this. They have those bright eyes that are invested in the project they're working on and you're sliding in their STEM education that way, I'm really not a fan of learning in silos or just following tutorials online. So take a second to think and write down if you feel, or if you'd like to share, what are your kids' motivations and interests, as wild as they may be, right? Like some kids are just interested in trains or some are interested in, you know, a character from, a show or maybe they love to bake what is especially in this quarantine what are their motivations and interests and how can we let's do a little if anybody feels comfortable sharing we can do a little brainstorm of some ways that we can build around that And it's good to make a list as well because you might not have thought about this before, but I think it's nice to actually record. Um, yes, snakes. Okay, so yes. Okay, so let's think about snakes. What is it that he's so fascinated? Does he just like animals? Is it something about snakes? Is it a something, um, was there a movie or show like tease that out because i think there's so much there and especially for children they'll fixate on something so specific but when we tease out why it gives us a lot more information about how we can reach them so why do we think is there some aspect is it because it's like a scary animal is it because it i don't know what do we think I'm just, I'm asking him now, so this is what okay. we know. <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> um, his three reasons why he likes snakes are because they eat, oh. they, he likes all of them because they eat, they camouflage, and they camouflage, and what was the last one? Oh, and also they bite. They bite. He likes those things about snakes. Awesome reasons. Those are so <laughs> right? That's so great. I'm so glad that he shared that because those are so great. So when you think about that and the specific reasons, you can think about, okay, what are the, re the multimedia resources? What are the art connections? Like what materials could he use to make camouflaged animals? Was he interested in other camouflage? Like what videos could he use? Dramatic play? Like we could really, really tease that out. There are some robotic kits where you can, you know, a lot of roboticists are inspired by animal movement. So thinking about it that way, as opposed to just like getting a book on snakes really helps us open up his motivation to learn at home. I love that. I love Thank that. Thank you. Actually, that's so helpful because the only thing I could think is, was either get a snake, which is a no, right? <laughs> or um a book so i'm i like that you get you through all of those things because i never really thought that you about it Can't thank talk, you right? and even the camouflage part right like that's such a broad concept and it's so deep like there's so much that can be learned just through even examining camouflage so that's a great that's a great example i feel like i wish i had set you up but we worked that out anyway <laughs> so i love that Oh, that's awesome. And obviously afterwards we can talk about how to, how to make that, um, like a summer activity, 
a summer learning activity. Great. Anybody else? What are the what are your kids really interested in? And if you're making a list for yourself, I think that's helpful too. Or if you're a teacher, what are your students really interested in? Some years for me, it was really, one year we did a mystery study, which was by far my favorite unit of study that I've ever created. So incredible, so amazing. We use so much technology and in, in science in many different ways. Mystery was a great theme. Um, but it took really thinking critically about the kids in our class to, to pin down that it was mystery that they were into. Okay, so I'm going to move on or back, I should say, into some resources that I like and I think are um, great to use at home. So, and then let me just, Emily, are we wrapping up at 6.30? Um, I, yeah, I think that's what we had listed. Um, okay, so. that works for me. And then I'm happy to just stick around and, and work through any ideas um, that people have. Now, a disclaimer on this. <laughs> this is from my book, but I forgot the password to my digital copy. So there's like a, <laughs> a watermark, but this is from the book. <laughs> so... <laughs> I just didn't have time to erase it. I do, I do own the rights to it. Okay, so let's talk about, if you're, a, a few people in the chat said they are either beginner or, inter, or intermediate learners in STEM, so they need some resources. I'm going to list a few resources that I think are good. Um, obviously, if you know of others, please drop them in the chat, but this is where I like to start. Again, don't let your, inexperience or you know lack of prior experience in creative using creative technology hinder your child's learning there are a lot of diy that you can learn alongside with them there's a lot of diy there's a lot of tutorial work please don't let that be an excuse for why your kid isn't learning about technology. I hear it over and over again, though. I hear a lot of parents say, well, I put him in that camp because I don't know anything about computers. Learn alongside. We're all at home. There's no time like the present. So the first, if you have a student that's, we use Scratch. So the first website I'm going to talk about is Scratch. We use it in Girls Who Code for our incoming fifth graders, but I know students who are younger and older that use it. There's also a Scratch Junior, which is really just blocks that kids can put together to animate their characters on the screen or their sprites. So Scratch is a really great intro with a high ceiling website for coding. If you have a kid that's maybe had a little bit of coding in school, wants to do some at home, start there. There's also code.org, which um, has more of a structure. It's less creative, I would say, but there are more tutorials and it changes often. If your child has an hour of code, they probably have done code.org. I think this is a, a great site to use if you have a child that wants to learn how to animate a character to dance or how to code you know, a scene or a story. Um, but they need the skills to do that. They've got lots of different programming languages. Code.org is a good place to start. Khan Academy, you probably have used or at least heard of. Um, great resources for many different age ranges and many different topics, but definitely for science and technology. Now, Tinkercad, I really, really love Tinkercad. Um, this is very a very easy to use site for 3D modeling and will, I think they have some really great tutorials that you can use to start to put shapes together, to orient on the work plane, and to see how a 3D object is made from the bottom up. Now you may not have access to a 3D printer. There are some third party sites that you can send to. Um, they tend to get really, really, really expensive. I've done them before for projects 
um, that I was not paying for. And I felt like this is an astronomical rate. So I'm not necessarily going to um, endorse, <laughs> endorse any of them. But if you know somebody who has a 3D printer, maybe a local library, maybe your child's teacher at school, I don't know, 3D printing has not necessarily crossed all the way mainstream, but Tinkercad is excellent. And I think it really is a powerful STEM tool because it helps students understand um, how 3D models can be made and to get them creative. Rob, do you want to add something there? Yeah, I just wanted to say too that um, designing things in Tinkercad to be 3D printed is a great challenge and cool if you have access. But if you design things that aren't meant to be 3D printed, it's a, it actually really frees you up mm. to, to let your imagination run wild because you don't have to worry about will it print or not, will it be too big. Um, so that's, you know, both are good challenges, but um, yeah, you absolutely don't need a 3D printer to really right. get a lot out of Tinkercad. And then, like I said, that my, my first link is a whole resource page on on Tinkercad stuff, so. Yes, thank you. I definitely think that's a great resource, even for adults, because I never had like CAD software training um, in my STEM classes growing up, but that's a great place to make a model of a snake. That's a great, I've had kids make their own custom game pieces, again, just even for the 3D environment. Um, or their own dolls or their own Barbie accessories. The mo modeling as a skill is important and it's um, not common, right? And this is a website that, the, you know, you use the software in the browser, it's free to use. Let's take advantage of these tools because where else will kids get the, the skill set? I also really love Instructables. Instructables has a ton of DIY projects and some are super simple and some are super complicated, but I love being able to search for a project and to see um, how it works step, or how to build step by step. There are some great electronics projects there, um, some that aren't STEM related, some that are cooking or science. I mean, it's a wealth of info. This is a short list. I could say so much more. I also have to do a plug for Girls Who Code. It's going virtual. Well, it's virtual now, probably will be for the next school year as well. But if you have a middle school or high school aged girl, I love Girls Who Code. Half of the um, curriculum is based on computer science. The other is about social emotional learning. So including um, grit, confidence, um, problem solving, just really everything you'd want young girls to have, especially when they enter the field of technology, both hard skills and soft skills. I have to make a plug. First Lego League and robotics clubs at schools. I don't know what's happening with them now, to be honest. Um, but I'm assuming there will be some type of virtual pivot. Also, if your child learns to code or program a robot, you can have that robot run the program in a virtual environment. So even if you don't have the kid at home, you can still have your child run programs and watch how it would run on screen, which I think is still a valuable experience. Um, and in terms of materials, I do have a few quick videos to show. Um, Let's see if I can. So I'm going to show you one of my favorite robotics companies, which is Sphero. Let's see if this works because, okay, so this should be a video of students using a robot from Sphero. One is controlling it on, I don't know if this is gonna work. One is controlling it on a, tablet and then you can see it okay i thought that was much longer but <laughs> um so that's i think that's the sphero 
bolts. I can't quite remember which one it is, but I think at this point they have several robots that I really love because they, as you can see, they interact with the physical world. They can either be driven like a manual override. So kids are just understanding like directionality and speed, or they can write programs that allow their robot to move in specific ways and do specific challenges. I really love, again, these, these materials are cost prohibitive in my opinion, which is why I try to get schools to buy them. At this point, I do think if, the, if your budget allows, there are some good tools that are less money than this, but these are some that um, when I'm asked, I think are good. Um, in the past school year, I've also used little bits. Let me see if this is going to play. I don't know if I had that on my resource list, but little bits are little circuits that you snap together. I've used them with kindergarten, first, second grade, up to fifth grade, really. Um, they include lights, sensors, all kinds of really fun bits. I think they're under Sphero now as well. Um, but this is a student adjusting LED, the color. So you can see that they're really using their hands well. And I feel like the ceiling is really high for what they can do. I love the projects that they have. Um, and let me just flip back to I'm running out of time. So let me just go back very quickly to my other screen. See, I always mess myself up when I do that. <laughs> I think I'm sharing my, okay. Am I back to my presentation? No, okay, let me see. Uh, I, this is the part that I always, okay, let's see. Yes. Okay. Here we go. All right. So makey makey, another great tool for, okay. Sphero. We, I showed you the video on that. Ozobot, I love those little robots. They can be programmed by using different color markers. I think that really is steam to me because I've seen kids draw their own maps or use different folded, piece of folded pieces of paper to make the robots move and travel in a way that's super creative. Makey Makey also uses found materials and connects them to the computer so you're interacting. Anything that I can, anything that gets students away from just the virtual realm and brings it to a physical realm and they can interact with it, I love, I think it's so great. Adafruit has amazing projects, kits. I think Rob, you know most about that. Um, and Circuit Playground is what we're going to use for physical kits. Um, when we send out for Girls Who Code, we're gonna start more physical computing and sending them kits at home so that they can do projects and we'll do a virtual share. Lego, we do, and Mindstorm have traditional been, traditionally been used in robotics at school. Really cost prohibitive, but I do think that if your school is starting to share materials at home, I think that's an experience that kids should not miss. It's really crucial to their STEM education. So I would urge you to um, kind of, even if your school is going virtual, to lean on them and to find out what kind of materials can be shared. Um, again, the equity gaps and the gaps in education are only widening at this point. So anywhere where we can fill in gaps and bring expertise and share resources and bring it back for children, it's so, so crucially important. Um, oh good, Janice's daughter really likes Scratch. I love it. I think there's some great projects to get inspiration from. So let me see. Oh, last, last thing, just a quick plug. My book is coming out. Um, it's called The Big Book of Invisible Technology. I'm really excited about it because I feel like it's a text that highlights the importance of learning about technology with a focus on it being about creating a better world. So understanding what makes technology work and move and run and power our world and how we can harness it to create. Um, and the publishing company really, really 
challenged me in a way that I hadn't been challenged before, and that is to, my dog is coughing, sorry. That is to come up with experiments that rely on very little material. So nowhere does it say, get your kid a $300 robotic kit to learn about robots. It's all very, very low tech that you would already have um, materials for, but it's about the concept. So to give you, let me see. So for instance, this project is called Machine Learning Madness. And it's more about my, you know, what, I, what I'm alluding to with this project is really about the equity in machine learning and thinking about how things are grouped. So they're using scissors and glue and old magazines and old newspapers and trying to come up with categories, who you see in those categories, who you don't see, what classifies them. So I'm not, none of the projects are based on having to buy anything out of the ordinary. It's very crafty, but also thinking with a high ceiling about like, hmm, how would a computer identify a cat versus a dog? And when it messes up, why? And trying to understand that technology is something we build, we put our biases into, um, it's something that we should have control over, but when we don't have an education about it, we hand over our control. So I really, I'm really excited about it. It's in, it's on Amazon, Target, Walmart, Barnes and Noble, and a few independent sellers, including black owned bookstores. So um, I'll just put the link to my website. And then you can see it there. And other than that, thank you so much for I have a quick question. And, I have a quick question. Oh, sure, Hello? sure. Yes, I'm my here. Question, my question is what age range or, or what ages uh, does your book target? So it's written for ages 8 to 12, but I honestly okay. think that that's like the age range. I think that there, it depends on your child's interest and experience, right? Like there are 16 year olds that have never learned about how drones work or the history of computing or machine learning. And so, yeah, everything is going to be brand new. Um, and there are kids that are younger that are really, really passionate about learning about technology and could use a little help with a grown up reading to them. So. Okay, thank you so much. You've, you've done a great job. I really appreciate being able to sit in and, and learn about uh, incorporating uh, STEAM into uh, my children's curriculum this school year. So thank you so much for, for sharing. Thanks for being here. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. And I wish everybody the best in the fall, no matter what we do. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody wants to type or unmute. Yeah, I'm just going to echo uh, what was said. This is, this has been great. I, I love these events because we get like a little bit of a front seat to people's expertise. Um, and it's really exciting to hear from you, like as your book is coming out. That's Yeah, I'm, ta I'm dragging my family to Barnes and Noble. And <laughs> <That's Damn. laughs> so, I, yeah. we, I mean, it, it, we'll stick around as long as, as long as you want to, Chloe. Um, I'm just going to drop the link in for Nina, uh, Nina's Shine Artistry profile again. Um, and again, if, especially if you're in the Pittsburgh area, uh, Nina runs a makerspace called Assemble that has a really strong focus on STEAM education for um, elementary and middle school and, and high school kids. She also has some adult nights, which are super fun, uh, but have mostly been canceled due, due, due to COVID. Yeah. She's done a great job pivoting um, to a lot of digital learning. And so uh, if you're also, if you're an educator, regardless of whether or not you're in Pittsburgh, I, I think it's worth checking out her website to see um, some of the things that she's done to take her uh, usual summer camp online. Uh, and anything that anyone who is here today can contribute to our Shine Artistry profile um, is extremely appreciated, uh, as well as your attendance just in general.